I'm here today because for the last six, seven years, I have been constantly angry, I have been sad, and I have been frustrated. I still am. <laughs> and this is because I want to help people. It's my job, it's my passion. People who struggle with complex social problems, homelessness, addiction. And these people are often on social benefits, which is the theme of this talk. And I have these feelings because I keep finding that the systems we have built to help people more than too often becomes the reason why people end up feeling worse when asking for help. And I want to understand why, and I wanted to understand why for a long time. So back in 2013, I chose to be homeless for half a year, and I chose this out of my own free will. It was not forced on me, but it was still hard. Um, and I did it for two reasons. The first reason was that I wanted to understand the complexities of the system. I wanted to understand the people who were struggling. So I went to a shelter every morning and every afternoon at 8 o'clock and 12 o'clock, and I had breakfast and I had lunch with people. I played chess with them and I lost, and, and I got to know them, these people and their stories. And as I grew closer to them, I went to them to their meetings with their caseworkers at the employment centers, which was a hard experience, because I, I got to watch people go to a meeting that, that didn't help them. And I saw brilliant people who were, had studied to be social workers who were frustrated that they couldn't do what they wanted to do. And the other reason why I chose to be homeless was that I wanted to build an alternative. I wanted to build an organization that could help people in a different way. I call it the foundation. This is, could also be grandma's living room, because um, you feel safe there. Now, the difference between that organization and, and the way the public system works is that when you're on social benefits, there are certain rules and laws that applies. So in order to get money every month, you have to attend certain meetings. You have to do certain things. And if you fail to do so, you can risk being sanctioned, losing some of your money, which then makes you more stressed or more anxious. But we couldn't do this at the organization. So what we did was that we could only provide comfort, love, hugs, lots of hugs, and, and activities and ideas. And we went on trips. We paid for our fitness memberships. We, went, we, we got them good internships. But we couldn't force anyone to do anything. And what really stuck to me was that I was running the organization for around five years, and I saw people getting better, people who were by many deemed unfit to study or unfit to work, often by themselves as well. But I saw people rise to the occasion and get better. And so instead of being just happy, I got frustrated once again, which I often do, because um, it seemed unfair that people who were coming to us and getting better, or people who were getting better visiting other social organizations. What about the people who didn't meet us or anyone else? Shouldn't it be the, the systems we have created from the state and from the public that, that worked? So I, I knew I had to change something more, the laws and the rules. So I created Center for Social Rethinking. I gave uh, the leadership of the foundation to other people, and they run it today. And now I have this organization, and I love it. And what we do is that we're trying to get into the depth of things, finding out why is things not working, why are they not working as they should, and how do we fix them? And one of the first things we did was that we got, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy at this moment, because I just finished <laughs> setting up a book, and I didn't know how, so I had to go on YouTube and learn InDesign, but I managed. Um, but we got a sponsorship to look into social benefits. We looked at the research and the projects and the literature from all over the world. And we wanted to see if there was a silver lining, something that kept coming up, which there was. And one of the greatest things that came up, well, it's not great, but it's interesting because we're doing this in Denmark, because Denmark has the most expensive employment policies in the world. They're quite expensive, actually. And one could argue that this means we also provide something. We, we, we provide better services than other countries, perhaps. But you should also expect a better output from these expenses. We should have the best social system in the world. 
And we have in some senses, but definitely not in all. One of the other things that came up, which for me was groundbreaking to find, was some Danish researchers who went back all the way to 1984, and they looked at everyone on social benefits. And then they looked at how many of these people are still on social benefits six years later. It was 70%. And this doesn't tell you much, but it tells you much if you keep looking at the numbers. So in 1992, I believe, they looked back again. Everyone on social benefits, how many of these people are still on social benefits six years later? The number didn't change. And what you need to remember here is that economy changes, we pass new laws, new reforms, new bills are passed, so things should change. So when they did it again, and they looked at this in 2002, and again looked at how many of these people were on social benefits six years later, the number almost didn't change, 71%. And now things change. We start applying stricter laws, more rules, we lower the social benefits so people have less income, because we wanted, we wanted to push people into jobs. So they looked at the numbers again from 2012, and you might think it's the same, it's not. It's now 72% who are still on social benefits six years later. So since 1984, nothing has changed. We spend more money, we have a lot of new laws, I'll tell you that, because I have to study them all. But it's not working, and I think I know why. It's a bold statement, but I'm pretty sure I, I feel like I'm at the core of it now. And I've, I think it's because we have built it, the whole system is built on a false premise. It's built on a premise that people can work, they can study, they just don't want to. And if that's true, we have to push people, lower their income, force them, give them sanctions, make them realize that you have to do something with your life, but you don't want to. But if we're wrong, and I believe people want to work, they want to study, they just can't right now. And that's what I saw at the foundation. Everyone wanted to, they just needed the proper guidance and the proper help. And if that's, that's true, that would flip the whole approach upside down, the way we make the laws and the, and the, and the rules. So, another thing that kept coming up, which for me, I can't forget it, I can't let it go. Through all this research, every single one of these show one thing. The more you increase forced activity on people on social benefits, the more you decrease activity. So the more you force people to do something, the less they do. And when you give people freedom to choose, more people start working, more people start studying. And that for me says a lot. And there's all kinds of reason for that. I have a book of 200 pages. I have 12 minutes here. It's hopeless. But <laughs> we have a whole chapter on behavioral insights. What is it that goes on in our mind? Why is it that, that force prevents, of, prevents us from making long-term decisions? But I can't tell you about it because I don't have the time. <laughs> but what I can tell you is that in order to, like, I can have an idea, I can have values, I can have conclusions, but I need solid proof evidence. So together with some top researchers and, and, and lots of experts who are a lot better than me at this stuff called research, we have designed an experiment, which we will be rolling out next year. And this is how it's built. And this is a very brief telling of, of it. So we're gonna divide people on social benefits into three groups in three cities, actually four, but it sounds better, and for three years. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> You can do it in three cities, but they have to be really big, because then you have enough people, so it's more valid. So, the first group is what we call a control group. We don't change anything. We just follow them for three years, how they're doing, how they're feeling, how many people start working, start studying, and how their caseworkers doing. That's important too. Going to work to help people has to be good, because or else you're not gonna last very long. The other group, we change one thing. They now have the same thing as we had at the foundation, voluntarily participation. They can say, no, thank you. So any meeting, any activity, they can say, no, I don't want to do that. And they don't have to fear being sanctioned. So the caseworker is now not a person who can take your money. They're only a person who can recommend, come with ideas. 
The last group, which for me is very interesting, is also a group that has the ability to say no thank you. But we also provide them with extra efforts. The caseworker and the citizen get a citizen's budget. It is extra money you can use without having to apply for it. I need my tattoos removed because no one will give me a job. I need a driver's license. I need therapy. I need, I need any kind of help you can ask for, you get it. And there's all these different things in this group, which is like, again, a new book we, we wrote of 50 pages. But we can follow these three groups for these three years. And after that, we have crystal clear data in, in which group will most people find jobs, where are they feeling better, where are they starting to study, how are the caseworkers doing, how do they feel about going to work. And this is, for me, very interesting. And this is something we're ready to do. I have the cities. I almost have the funding. There's just one problem. It's illegal. Because the rules and the laws are very clear in this area. If you receive social benefits, you have to do these things. I'm not, I'm not allowed to tell people, just say no. So what I'm doing now is that I'm spending all my time in the parliament. I'm talking to politicians, members of government, filling out forms and having meetings, and hopefully, and it looks like it, we will get the permission to do it. And for me, this is, it, this is sort of brilliant because I have been so angry and so frustrated for so many years, but now I feel like there's a sense of hope as well because we worked so hard on this, and it looks like we're finally going to be allowed to do it. And for me, I'm hoping that this will create a ripple effect, that other cities and governments and, 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 and organizations will use the data, use the research, and use this project. Now, I told you about it in one slide, but there's so much to it. And I'm hoping they will use it so that by doing that, we can change the way we work with people on social benefits. And by doing that, I think we can change the lives of people struggling with complex social problems and their caseworkers and other people who do social work. And my hope is that it will also change how we view people and society as a whole. Thank you for listening. That's it.